saw you holding up there. Good. I, I just um, <laughs> ran, did a mad dash to the hotel in there. That was a fresh one. So, if I look at your piece of paper, please, that's what you put the film. Huh? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> So she's on steel. Learn to get back into the good start. Is Lauren here? Oh, she's there. Should we get? Should we go? Okay. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started. This is a phenomenal panel. I am so incredibly honored and excited to be up here with these incredible, incredible individuals who are real true champions of getting money out of politics. Um, I also want to say at the outset, um, Lauren, don't leave because um, I want to make sure that folks know that the, this panel is a brainchild of Lauren Windsor, who just did a phenomenal job putting this together. She's the creative director of American Family Voices, and thank you for, your, for conceiving of this, because it's really, really, really important. So let me tell you the premise of this panel. Uh, the premise of this panel, Money in Politics Candidate Forum, is this. We all know, we all know that there is a huge problem of big money in politics, right? It's overwhelming our elections. One figure that's, that always knocks me out is just as of May 30th, so this was even a couple of months ago, the outside spending in the 2014 elections is three times what it was in 2010 and 28 times what it was in 2006. It's just mushrooming, and, that's, and that was as of May 30th, so you can imagine what the numbers are now. It is a huge problem. We wouldn't, you all wouldn't be in this room if you didn't think it was a big problem. Okay, we also know there's ways to fix it, right? I mean, there's legislation that can work, there's administrative remedies that can work, disclosure, public financing. There's a lot of folks working on a constitutional amendment to overturn what the Supreme Court is doing. We know there are things that can work, right? The problem is that we need elected officials who would do the right thing. We, that's what the American people want. Nine out of 10 American people of the American people polled say they want their elected officials to do something about big money in politics. I mean, just if you look at just the, the incredible crowdsourcing success that, um, that we've seen in terms of the May Day Pact, Larry Lessig's May Day Pact, the energy and passion is there, right? It's what the American people want. We need elected officials who will do the right thing, and the only way to get elected officials to do the right thing is to get candidates who are willing to run on this issue so that when they get elected, they will be there and do the right thing. So that's what this panel is about. How do you do that? Why do you do that? What's involved in making the choice to do it? How hard is, is it to do it? How do you run against big money in politics when you have to run, raise money to run a campaign? So that's what this panel is about. I'm really, really excited that, that everybody has joined us. So I'm gonna just do some very, very brief introductions of the panelists, um, and, and then we'll get started. Oh, and just one housekeeping thing. If you're, if you're tweeting and stuff, the, use the hashtag NetRootsNation and N14, but also if you can use the Get Money Out hashtag, that would be great. There's real movement growing around the Get Money Out, and a lot of folks are, are coming together around that. So if you can use the Get Money Out hashtag as well as a Netroots Nation hashtag, that would be great. So um, on the panel, we have Shanna Bellows. Okay. Shanna is the Democratic candidate for US Senate in Maine, running against 18-year incumbent Republican Susan Collins. Shenna is best known for her tenure as executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Maine. The Progressive Change Campaign Committee has called her the Elizabeth Warren of Civil Liberties, which is a real <laughs> kudos, right? could do the same. Hats off to Shanna. <laughs> a, another hero, Rick Weiland, is a Sioux Falls small businessman and the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in South Dakota. Rick got his start in politics working for Tam da Tom Daschle, one of my heroes, in 1978, when Tom was first elected to Congress by 139 votes. Close election.
He's also served as regional director for FEMA, South Dakota State Director for AARP, and as the CEO of the International Code Council, where he helped develop the country's first green building code. He's a committed, committed public servant. Rick is running to get big money out of politics and take back our government. He believes our elected officials need to answer to everyday Americans and no longer be beholden to big money donors. And on the back of his card is, right, is about getting big money out. <laughs> Kelly Westland was raised in a military family, spending much of her time in the southern part of the country. As the executive director for the nonprofit organization, the Alliance for Sustainability, where she focused on sustainable community and economic development projects. And as a small business owner, Kelly spent three years building a strong local food system through farm to table events, community supported agriculture, wholesale marketing distribution, and organizational efficiencies. So welcome, Kelly. And last. to protect voting rights and get corporate money out of politics. And just, I have to say, there isn't anybody who knows more about this issue than Derek. I mean, he is a source of information, wisdom, and inspiration to, to all of us. So it's incredible to have Derek here. Um, Derek didn't win his election, but the legislature responded to his campaign by referring a question to the November ballot. Prop 49 is now on the ballot, a ballot initiative calling on the congressional delegation to support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and other cases and to get big money out of politics. So really, it's, it's very exciting, very exciting. And prior to, to announcing his campaign, Derek served as Common Cause's Vice President of State Operations, and he just did a huge amount of work in the um, whole amendment movement. So welcome to Derek. So that's our panel. Another quick round of applause for the panel, and then we're going to get started. Okay. About your personal experiences that led you to really feel that like you had to include this in your campaign. Shanna, do you want to start? I had many opportunities through public schools, good community supports, and today I'm running for the United States Senate. But my background is not one of wealth, and my career has been dedicated to nonprofit service. I served in the Peace Corps, I was an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer, and then I spent the last decade at the American Civil Liberties Union. People like me do not run for federal office very often because these races cost millionaires. And that's why we have a Congress of millionaires instead of a Congress that's truly representative of the wonderful diversity in this country. And that's why we see laws at the national level favoring the largest corporations and the wealthiest individuals at the expense of our communities. That's why I think that this is fundamental to our democracy and the future of our democracy. We are not going to see the change we need for the economy, for the environment, for civil rights and civil liberties until we have a more representative democracy. And what we need to get there is to get money out of politics. That's why it's a top issue for me. Great, thank, thank you. you. Well, you know, I spent, uh, as Marge indicated, a good share of Minnesota, and the last part of my career has been in the, uh, in the private sector. And uh, I never thought I would jump back into elective politics again, but um, you know, so much is not working right now uh, with our government. And uh, when, you, when you hear people just 
you know, basically throwing their uh, throwing the towel in, or, or, or just throwing their hands up, saying, you know, it's so broken we can't fix it. Uh, that they want to basically destroy the government in order to fix it, to burn it to the ground. Uh, you know, you just sit back and say, no, no, that's not the problem. Government per se is not the problem. A government that has been bought and paid for by special interests right. is the problem. And when you can connect, as I have, uh, part of my campaign has been to get out to every town in my home state of South Dakota. 311 towns have been to every one of them, and I've started this whole process over again, uh, this last phase of my campaign. But when you go out there and you talk to them about, you know, why it is we can't afford to, say, fund veterans health care. Sanders has got a, uh, Bernie Sanders has got a bill that's languishing in the conference committee right now to take care of our, vet our sons and daughters who we sent over to fight these wars, and the Republicans are saying we don't have money to take care of them. And I always say, well, no, wait a minute. What about all those tax provisions that allow big corporations to park money over in Irish bank accounts? You know, why don't we shut those down and take care of our sons and our daughters that we send off to fight these wars? Because, you know, Money controls Washington. They're the ones that have the lobbyists and the political contributions. And when you know this, when you know this, and you think you might be able to get out there and articulate that and connect the dots, then we got a shot. We got a shot. The American people have a fair shot. I think it is the number one issue for our country. This room should be packed, standing room only because we're not going to get at good health care reform, we're not going to get at a good energy policy, we're not going to get at what we need to do with public education, we're not going to get at taking care of our veterans until we get money out of politics. That's why I'm in. <laughs> Kelly? <laughs>
And it, I have to say, for, from all the issues I was campaigning on, it had by far the most power. And it was amazing. I would go to uh, county Democratic Party committees and Democratic clubs and talk about all the reasons I was running. And that one would get standing applause. Like people would spontaneously bust out. And, and the other candidates saw this, both in my race and people who were running for the legislature and other statewide offices. And I, you know, it's not that they were afraid of my campaign or anything like that, but they saw the grassroots power and enthusiasm behind this issue. And that actually led to some very good outcomes, which I'll, you know, talk about in a sec. But the, the, it wasn't just my campaign. There were other sort of spontaneous forces of, of real grassroots energy around this issue. Um, one of them was a, another campaign that didn't succeed in, in her winning office, uh, but Marion Williamson ran for Congress in Henry Waxman's old seat with this as a central piece of her campaign. And uh, it both raised the issue in the district and it also got the attention of other candidates, one of whom uh, is likely to win that seat, a state senator, who decided to introduce this idea that I was talking about for the 2014 election. You know, forget about waiting till 2016. <laughs> so this was fabulous. And there was a great all-volunteer coalition called the Money Out Voters In Coalition that championed this. Um, and even then, I, I, so, so that got the thing actually in play in this year's legislature far faster than I'd ex expected it to be taken seriously. But even then, in, in March at the Democratic Convention uh, in California, I was thanking one of the bill's authors, and, and you know, thanks for taking this on. And she said to me, yeah, 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 but it's not actually going to pass. Don't, don't get your hopes up. So this is a thing that was not supposed to happen. Um, and then, you know, so in addition to my campaign, in addition to Miriam Williamson's campaign, the net roots really did light this thing up. And, you know, Courage Campaign, PDA, DFA, lots of groups started bombarding legislators with emails and, and doing kind of uncouth things like tying up their fax lines and being obnoxious. And, and <laughs> they, the legislators got it. They really did start to understand the power of this issue, and it, it moved through the legislature and through committees that had killed it previously. It was a great joy to see the chair of the Assembly Elections Committee hold his nose and explain that he didn't think this was appropriate, but he was going to let it move through as a courtesy. Uh, and he's the guy who killed it the year before. And then one of the things that I think helped push it over the top, I, I see my friend Kai Newkirk here, um, who led a march with an organization, 99 Rise, uh, from Los Angeles to Sacramento. And I, I joined this march as a candidate on, on its first day and, and tried to help lift it in visibility. And then on its final day, I, I joined it after my election was over, but the, the guy got me arrested. He, so be careful <laughs> about him. Um, but the end story is that two days ago, Jerry Brown, made a point of saying, I'm allowing this to go to the ballot without my signature. Um, and, and I think it's a strong indication that this would not have happened were it not for all of those things I just described. And to me, the real takeaway for anyone thinking about running for office on this issue is, is there is real unhardest organic energy around this issue in a way that you know I, I have not seen in, in 20 years of organizing around this thing. And, my conclusion after being an advocate on this, an issue advocate from the outside, is what we need to succeed is for candidates to start running on this issue and start winning on this issue, and for those who are on the wrong side of this issue to start losing. And I feel like we're on the cusp of that happening. So I'm, I'm excited that this panel is here. I'm excited that, that these folks are also out there um, running on this, and, and I feel like we're onto something. That's, that's great. I want to build on, on that because... <laughs>
raised my opponent, 18-year incumbent Republican Susan Collins, and we had contributions. To date, we have contributions from over 365 towns. Now, to date, we have raised $1.3 million, which in Maine is a very big deal. Uh, a week's worth of television costs approximately $33,000 to be on statewide. <laughs> Folks in California, I know, are jealous. <laughs> but the best part about that isn't that we've raised over a million dollars. Um, it, it's shocking to me, growing up with the background that I did, that politics costs this much, and it's horrifying in a sense. But our average contribution was $60, hmm. and our median contribution was $6 with our $1.3 million. So half of our contributions are $6 or less. And our contributions are coming from people, like a woman that I met in Mount Vernon, Maine. And I was on the stump, and I was talking about my platform, including expanding Social Security and raising the minimum wage and all of these progressive values that we share in this room. And she came up to me afterward, and she said, I'm one of those seniors, the one in three Mainers that's surviving solely on Social Security. And sometimes my check doesn't make it to the end of the month, and I have to go to the food pantry. But I want to be part of this movement. I'm going to my car. If you can hold on, I'm going to write you a $5 check. I want to be part of this campaign. Mm -hmm. So what I am finding is that people are inspired to act, to participate, and to contribute. The danger is there are some people who are feeling so frustrated, so turned off, and so hopeless. You know, and, and, and the large corporations and the Republicans want people to believe that this is impossible that it will never happen. They want to cultivate a sense that the game is over. And so we need to make sure that we lift everyone up in our movement and that we don't allow people, that we try to keep people from just leaving it entirely. Because I have experienced that too. Some people with the means to give much more than $5 saying, it doesn't matter anymore. I can't compete with the Koch brothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we walk away, the Koch brothers win. Thanks. Rick, what? Yeah, everybody needs to. And when you, you know, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, try to connect the dots for them and under make, it, make them understand what it really means, what big money's influence is doing in public policy. You know, I, I, I think they, they are starting to get it. I've had over 160 town hall meetings in the trek through South Dakota. I've made it a point to go to every town. Uh, and when I start talking, especially in rural America, rural South Dakota, which is heavily dependent on agriculture, you know, we've got a farm bill, right? It's supposed to be our farm bill, but it's really a farm bill for big corporate agriculture. 75%, and this is why he's talking about connecting, 75% of the, of the program dollars we put into our farm bill go to the top 4% of the producers. And when I say that to my, my farmers out there, none of them are in the top 4%, but that's big, uh, you know, we're subsidizing big agriculture at the expense uh, of the family farmer. And you know, so that, that computes. They, they get that. Now, this guy that I'm running against, the, I'm actually I'm running against three, which I maybe get a chance to talk about later, but the Republican nominee makes this, uh, this boast to try to get people out of the primary that he's going to go out and raise $9 million, and he's going to have to spend 85% of his time outside of South Dakota raising it. And I love to, I mean, we've, we've, we've uh, dubbed him the $9 million man. We're asking, like, <laughs> Shannon, we're asking people to give us $9. So if you get on Act Blue, every contribution limit, you know, it's $9 instead of 10, or it's 59 instead of 50, or 109. I have people sending me checks for $99.99 .99 because we're trying to drive home the point that if we can get a million people in this country to give me $9, I'll match the $9 million candidate dollar for dollar. But I think it's a matter of connecting the dots and making it real to them. When they realize what's going on, and I love to use this, and I heard uh, uh, Vice President Biden and I think Elizabeth Warren said, think about it. It used to be a, a government of form by the people. That's what it was. That, that's what our founding fathers wanted. It's become a government of for and by big money and special interests. And when you just say that over and over in those small towns, I believe, I believe it does connect, mm -hmm. and I do believe they're firing up and getting into that message. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
a lot of the folks that I've been talking to, you know, early on, back in December when we first jumped in, were expressing that disillusionment, that frustration, that my voice doesn't count. And what we've seen as we've been organizing is the same thing. Those small dollar contributions are coming from a broad base of people. We are now at over 10,000 individual contributors. Our average contribution is somewhere closer to $20 per person. And I have people, uh, same thing, those individual stories. I have a, a disabled veteran in um, Vilas County who lives on Social Security. He, uh, he, he takes advantage of the food shelf and he sends me a check for $1 every month like clockwork because he wants to be a part of what we're doing. That's so, that's, how can, you, how can you not have faith that we can change this when there are people like that out in the world? You know, and you're absolutely right. This used to be a government for and by the people. And when you can connect the dots about how the influence of this money, you know, translates into policy that affects real people and their communities, people follow that and it resonates with them. And I like the phrase, you know, the government of the many, not the government by the money. You know, it's something that <laughs> kind of makes people kind of stop and think that, you know, as we see the separation of wealth, as wealth accumulates higher and higher up the chain, um, as people at the very top get richer and richer, political power goes with it. And unless we change the way that we do politics and reject that framework, it's never going to go back to a way where, where citizen voices count more than campaign contributions. Uh, and just one more thing real quick. I, I border my district with Rick Nolan, who served in the Congress many years ago, way back in the 70s, I believe, and then came back recently. And there was an interview with him where he talked about how when he was there the first time, you know, he was a legislator. He went there to do the people's work to legislate. And now he's back in Washington, and the expectation is that he's going to put in 30 hours of call time dialing for dollars. How the heck do we expect, oh wait, we have a do-nothing Congress. Maybe they're so non-productive because they're spending all of their time dialing for dollars instead of working on behalf of the people who elected them. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like... Uh... <laughs>
to them. And so we need the progressive movement to be backing candidates who are losing the fundraising race. Right. That's how I think we overcome the cynicism thing. Great. Thanks. Two former Republicans running as independents uh, in uh, November. One is a former United States senator. Uh, this is his seat, actually, the one I'm running for. Tim Johnson beat him in 1996. He's trying to make a, a political comeback. You know, our, our thinking is he'll take votes away from, from the Republican nominee. And then we have a, uh, a, a, a former state legislator and gubernatorial candidate, a Republican, who's the founder of the, of the South, Dakota, uh, South Dakota Tea Party. And uh, so now he's now on the ballot as, the, as an independent candidate. And then we have Mike Rounds, who's the former governor now running, uh, who won his primary with less than, uh, uh, I guess, uh, flying colors. He spent $3 million and still lost 45% of the vote to, to uh, four Republican challengers. But I just heard today that Americans for Prosperity is opening up an office mm -hmm. in my state. So that must tell you <laughs> we are making some serious progress because now we're all, all of a sudden on the Koch uh, brothers' radar screen. Um, but, you know, uh, he, yeah. It, it is challenging. It really is. When, when uh, Mike Rounds decided he was going to raise $9 million out of state, I, I used to love to say, well, you know, I'm in Dallas, South Dakota, shaking hands at Frank Day's bar. And Mike <laughs> Rounds is in Dallas, Texas, shaking down big oil. And that's mm -hmm. the truth. I mean, he was. The same day I was in Dallas, South Dakota, he was in Dallas, Texas. It felt like I'd been given a gift. But that kind of <laughs> contrast... You know, to be able to say that to the people of South Dakota, they don't, they, that doesn't feel right to them. That's just, that's not quite right. And the fact that you can spend and raise all that money, you know, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win. It just doesn't. Going to all those towns is a process of earning it versus buying it. Mm -hmm. Now, I told him when he made his boast about $9 million, I said, well, let's, I said, Mike, that's, that's not going to be good for South Dakota. I frankly, it's not going to be good for the country. Let's limit contributions to 100 bucks. And he said, no way. I said, well, let's get together then and see if we can't keep at least money from out of state coming into our state. He wouldn't even return the phone call. Okay. So then I have to, I said, listen, if he doesn't want to change the rules, he wants to play by the rules as they exist today, I have no other choice. So I'm raising as much money as I can from whoever I can. I mean, I have a little, uh, what do they call a little card reader I can put on my iPhone. It's gotten to that point where you can walk around and have people swipe their credit cards. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's come to that point. It's ridiculous. But, you know, I, I love to use this in my state. Uh, Ronald Reagan believed, I always say, you know, to my town hall meetings, Ronald Reagan believed in world peace, but he didn't want the Soviet Union to have all the nuclear weapons. So I'm not unilaterally disarming in this game of money. I'll raise whatever I can, wherever I can, as long as people know the first bill I introduce is a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United in McCutcheon. Okay. against a popular Republican incumbent, and the establishment thought he couldn't win, and he did, and he changed history for all of us. So I will be outspent, but I like to say we don't need to outspend my opponent, we just need enough to be able to have a strong grassroots get out the vote campaign. Right now we have six field organizers and six offices across the state of Maine. I'm reviving a Maine tradition of walking the state literally from the northern border, the Canadian border in Holton, Maine, to the New Hampshire border in Kittery, Maine. I start on Sunday. We're walking over 350 miles through 63 right. communities. <laughs> and we're doing that because we want to represent what democracy should look like. 
It should be about conversations in backyards and living rooms and the local cafes and the gas stations, meeting with voters just like Rick has done in visiting every town in South Dakota. And it's amazing. I will tell you this. We have had to schedule call time into the walk. So we have been calling Mainers across the state to say, can Shenna, can, my team has been calling, to say, can Shenna use your landline for four hours from X time to Y time on this day so that I can call donors? Because we do need enough tele money to be up on television. You know, we're going up today. We need to be able to stay up until election day because name recognition is such a challenge in today's media environment particularly for challengers, particularly for people who are not self-funded and do not come from money. So we don't need to outraise our opponent. We need to raise enough. That's why I'm doing call time just like Rick and trying to raise our goal is $3 million. Great. Thanks. So, so Kelly, you don't have any problem with outside money, right? Well, actually, my... Uh my, my congressman, Sean Duffy, uh, two of his top five funders have been Americans for Prosperity and Coke Industries. Ooh. There is a proposed mountaintop removal mining project in the district, uh, something that's actually the watershed where I live. Um, so I've been active in that issue since I served on city council in 2011. But what we saw is that with Scott Walker in the governor's mansion with the Republican state legislature, we've had huge environmental rollbacks as a result of outside money being invested in our political process. And so what we saw recently, though, we had spring elections in April. There's also a lot of frac sand mining for the tar sands um, folks and a lot of resource extraction happening in Wisconsin right now, which has, has a long history of being a conservation-focused state. And um, these Americans for Prosperity just spent $15,000 in two separate county board races trying to influence decisions made about local control as it governs these resources. At the same time, the state assembly and the state senate seats that include the proposed mine where I live are both open seats. You better believe they're going to be at play in the 7th Congressional District. They also employ Sean Duffy's wife, Rachel, Cam Rachel Campos Duffy, as the spokesperson, national spokesperson for the Libre Initiative. So, um, it, you know, if there's this idea that there won't be big money, that they already spent $6 million between the two candidates and outside money in the last election for this seat. So I know what I'm up against, but I too take a great solace in the story of Paul Wellstone, and I often quote him when I'm talking to folks. And one of my favorite things that he had to say was that, and unfortunately, this was you know, before Citizens United, so oftentimes when I say it now, people kind of laugh. Um, but he says, or he said, um, politics is not about money or power games or winning for the sake of winning. Politics is about improving people's lives, about advancing the cause of, uh, advancing the cause of peace and justice in our country and the world. And I think we ought to get back to that. Yeah. So, so, Derek, tell us about the state level. Or what? Well, I think there's a, a very big difference between down-ballot races, especially in California, and congressional and U.S. Senate races. And it's important for progressives to understand that. You know, so just the facts are, you know, I, I was outspent five to one by the other Democrat who came in first place in my primary. But th that is not the biggest reason I lost, not even close. The, the guy who came in second, Republican, spent maybe $150,000. Um, and even the guy who won, who spent $2.5 million, that is not enough to run a serious campaign in the state of California. So this race and many, many, many other races are situations where nobody has enough money to buy serious name recognition. And all sorts of other factors come into play. In another race very similar to mine, the controller's race, which that and Secretary of State are like the two races people pay the least attention to, right? The, a, a Democrat uh, did win by being outspent about five to one, same ratio as mine, but uh, different factors in that race. And, and there was a Republican who almost made it into our top two after spending $6,000. Um, in California, and this is a reform that you all might think about having in other states, but you have a three-word ballot designation that describes your career. And for these down ballot races, and I think lots of local races, voters are casting their vote based upon that information. And so this guy who spent $6,000 was a chief financial officer running for state controller. People looked at that and said, oh, that sounds like he's pretty qualified. 
$6,000. So money had a big factor, I think, in influencing endorsements and people's perceptions of viability mm -hmm. far more than actually being mm -hmm. able to contact and move voters in my race. And, and I don't think that's true in a lot of congressional races. I have spent my whole career berating the undue influence of big money on elections, which I think is true. But I think it's equally true that there are lots of races out there that are very winnable on a grassroots scale and, and where being outspent is not the defining challenge. Thanks. So I want to get uh, in a minute to questions from the audience, but one last um, question about remedies and both what, what do you think needs to be done and particularly with respect to the Constitutional Amendment, which is something that people for the American Way and a number of organizations I think represent in this room and people in this room are working on. Um, the rap we get is it's too hard, it can't be done, it's a waste of time. You know, why, why fight for why, why fight for something that's so hard? So I'd be curious about the answer, both what remedies are important, but also constitutional amendment just seems so hard. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to that? Shanna? So in Maine, we have a system called Clean Elections for our state legislature. It's a public financing system for candidates. It's resulted in a very diverse legislature. People serving in our state legislature come from all walks of life, all ages, all backgrounds. It's amazing. I think we need a national clean election system, a national public financing s system to allow people from all backgrounds and walks of life to participate and compete on a level playing field in Washington. Mm -hmm. okay. At the same time, I support a constitutional amendment that would allow um, both Congress and state legislatures be very explicit to regulate campaign contributions and expenditures. I support the Harkin Amendment. Uh, and I, for those people who say anything is impossible, I say the only way we've ever achieved anything meaningful in this country is by taking on the impossible and having a vision for positive change and then working and doing everything in our power to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Rick? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I don't know how out, out or absent a constitutional amendment, uh, how else to approach this? I mean, because whatever the Congress does, the Supreme Court can undo. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, I'm going to read my constitutional amendment. I've been doing this for over a year, and I was so uh, 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 happy to see that now there are 43 senators on Udall's bill, which it's actually is the Constitution. It's 48 now. It's up to 48 now. Well, if I get elected in November, <laughs> it'll be 49, uh, hopefully, considering that uh, the 48 are all there uh, come January. But I've been talking about this for over a year. And, you know, all of a sudden, it seems like it's becoming really popular now. So maybe we've hit this timing just about right. But this is on the back of my business card. I've given out over 20,000 of these cards, both to big donors and small donors and voters. But it reads, so that the votes of all rather than the wealth of the few shall direct the course of this republic. Congress shall have the power to limit the raising and spending of money with respect to federal elections. When I hand out my card, I say that's my platform. Mm -hmm. If they want to talk about ag policy, I can, t I can tie it into this. If they want to talk about health care policy, I can tie it into this. This is the number one problem facing this country, and this is what we need to fix. I think that I'm pretty much on the same page as far as a constitutional amendment. I would support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and the McCutcheon decision. I think that there are other great models that we can look at at the state level to be able to implement across this country. And part of that means also looking at you know some of these nonprofit organizations that are doing work that really has a lot of impact but isn't being accounted for as far as the money in politics. Um, I think that. You know, there's so much work to be done, and how do you how do you kind of overcome this sense of it's impossible? You know, when something is hard, you start by putting one foot in front of the other. That's how you move forward. And even if we don't see all the change in the world in my lifetime, at least we're going to see some progress. We have to move forward. We don't have a choice. And if you throw your hands up and you walk away from the table, that's the only way to guarantee that your voice is never heard. Okay, so we've got to make sure that we as citizens reclaim our voice, our power, and take that seat at the table to be a part of the discussion. Um, I guess that's... <laughs> Derek? Uh, well, obviously, I support a constitutional amendment to overturn all this stuff, but I, I am 
truly in the all of the above category mm -hmm. from a mm -hmm. policy point of view. E even when and if we do overturn Buckley and Citizens United, we're still going to need public financing of yes, campaigns, right. and we need disclosure, and we need redistricting reform, and we need you know to strike down the the uh, anti-voting laws. But uh, from a strategy point of view. I'm convinced that the way we get all of those things is we build the biggest movement that we can. And the way we build a big movement is by picking a big fight. And so you're not going to build a big movement by only organizing around incremental stuff. You're just not. Um, and yeah, it is going to be tough. And we shouldn't run from that. We should embrace it. But you know, in my lifetime, I've seen the Berlin Wall fall. I've seen apartheid fall in South Africa. You know, Nelson Mandela didn't end apartheid by fighting for incremental stuff only and saying, geez, let's see if we can improve kids' schools. No, he said apartheid's wrong, and they put him in jail for 23 years. So in John Lewis's lifetime, he's seen Jim Crow end in the South. It's coming back. But um, we have done big things, difficult things before in this country, and it is our time to do them again, and, and we certainly won't do them by running away from them or pretending to talk about them. Um, and I think there is a, a fundamental miscalculation in the movement that this is somehow a zero-sum game, and if you're pushing for this thing, you're, de you're taking resources away from another reform effort, and in my experience, it's the exact opposite. You, you're building a stronger movement that helps pass all of those things. In, in California this year, perfect example, you know, I, I was raising all of these issues in my campaign. Other crazy scandals were going on, by the way, which is a whole other story. But, you know, the legislature responded by doing a bunch of things. They did pass a disclosure bill. They passed, the, you know, California became the second state in the country to call for a constitutional convention to reverse Citizens United. And it did the thing that I was talking about that's now Prop 49. None of those detracted from each other because the movement didn't let the legislature say, oh, you've done that, problem solved. We, we were careful about describing each step as only one step forward and we need to do more and keep pushing. And as long as we do that, this stuff all adds value to each other. It doesn't distract. It, and so it, it, it's silly to argue about is one easy, is one hard. We should be doing it all. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, so. I think we have like about 20 minutes left or so. I've, uh, so let's, let's open it up to questions and it looks like we have a question right here. Um, can you, nobody, oh. just stand up if you can maybe, do you feel, or just stand up so folks can hear you, okay? <laughs> That's the super PAC to kill the super PACs, yes, right? Mayday yes. PAC, yeah. Lawrence Lessig? Yeah. yeah. Thank I you. think it's great. Absolutely. I, I wish there were a few more of them, and I hope they get involved in Senate races as well as House races. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> because I think they're now focusing on five uh, legis uh, congressional races, which I'm, I'm happy for. But uh, no, I, I think that, you know, you fight fire with fire. You know, unfortunately, I don't think personally that we ever come out on top because the other side has got so much more than our side. But at least we're, you know, we're taking it, uh, we're taking it to the next step. And the model is crowdsourcing. And it's what the Netroots does. It's what groups like the Progressive Change Campaign Committee, Democracy for America, um, MoveOn.org, um, all at Blue America, all of these groups, I would not be here today, I would not be up on television today if it were not for the support of these progressive allies and the Netroots. My strongest support is in Maine, but it's, you know, the stakes are national. So uh, what Lessig is doing is crowdsourcing um, our support and demonstrating that small dollar contributions aggregated can be extraordinarily powerful. And we have to believe that's true. And we have to uh, put our money where our beliefs are, where our values are. You know, this is a shameless, uh, or shame, yeah, a shameless <laughs> plug, but... Um, someone told me there were 3,000 attendees at the conference. This is correct, yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So I did the math uh, this afternoon. I went home and I asked my uh, campaign manager, okay, how much is a gross rating point again? How much is a week of television? If everyone at Netroots got on rickweiland.com and gave nine bucks, you could put me on television for a week. Wow. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, thank you for bringing that up. I just want to say, you know, oftentimes when I'm talking to major donors, I do understand the sense of irony when I'm saying, yeah, we've got to get money out of politics. Can I please have some? You know? <laughs> and, and you have to do this. And I, I almost feel like sometimes it's part of the, uh, the trial by fire for candidates to make sure you're willing to do the work, but also to, you know, grovel and, and beg for money. But I think that this is a kind of a genius idea. And I love that there are so many people with the resources that are willing to say, OK, we're going to work hard to elect people who will undo this pro problem, who will fix this situation. And I'm so, I was so glad to see that it was so successful. And I'm hoping that you know, we'll really have a good example of how we can kind of put our money where our mouth is and make sure that we make those changes. It's got to happen. Derek, did you want to say? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's a significant development, and, and if you look at the reform movement of the last 40 years, the, the thing that it's been missing has been any kind of a serious electoral arm, and I think we're, we're moving to remedy that, and, and I hope it works. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that Lessig has said was embrace the irony, right, of yeah. super PAC to end all super PACs, but the important thing is, as folks have mentioned and have emphasized, that he's, the money will be invested in candidates who want to change the system, and so it is that that... You know, again, sort of we started the panel with, you know, we know there's a problem and we know how to fix it. What we need are people, elected officials who will do something about it. So, so you're saying, saying campaigns will still need the money. What I'm hearing up here is, yes, campaigns need the, need the money, but it's not only the money. It is the power of the people. And that what, what you're seeing here are examples of campaigns that have really figured out how to harness that energy. Um, which is not to say the money isn't important, but that it doesn't necessarily have to come from big money, you know, special interests that want something um, in return. Question? I'm Jenna, can you just repeat the question? I'm so not the sure question is, in light of the Supreme Court decisions and in light of the big money that has come into the state of Maine to destroy our public financing system, clean elections, what is the future of clean elections in Maine? It's in trouble right now. Um, it is still a viable system that is helping elect state legislators all across the state and helping make it possible for a wide range of candidates to run from both parties, from all walks of life. Uh, so it's still working, but we, we, and there's a wonderful group called Maine Citizens for Clean Elections, a grassroots group that's really taking a leadership role in protecting clean elections. Uh, we have a Tea Party governor. He won with 39% of the vote. And we, he's up for re-election, and it is our hope that he will be removed, and that that will, because the legislature is broadly supportive, but the governor has been very hostile um, to clean elections, and that matters too. I'm hopeful. I, um, I think, and there's talk of going back to the ballot, because clean elections, public financing in Maine, is something that the people passed. And the people actually passed it when my opponent was running 18 years ago. And in Washington, she's voted against the Disclose Act, and she voted for Alito and Roberts that brought us Citizens United and McCutcheon. So I really think we need to stand up uh, and, and stand up for bold vision on campaign finance reform. And as I recall, she's not currently sponsoring the Democracy for All Amendment. She is not a supporter of the Constitutional Amendment. Other questions? Here, yes, sir. So the question is advice from the panelists about corporate backed ballot measures as opposed to yeah. campaign uh, candidate campaigns. Derek, do you well, know? you know, in the long run, uh, the, the, we have court decisions saying we can't ban corporate money from ballot initiative campaigns. I tried that in Montana in 1996. That's part of the amendment work that we need to do. In the short term, you really can make disclosure laws work, um, particularly in California. We had. Um, an $11 million infusion in corporate cash into uh, uh, an effort trying to kill a, a revenue measure and, and kneecap labor unions from ever being involved in the political process. And uh, uh, when I was a common cause, we filed a complaint at the Fair Political Practices Commission that made this blow up 
in their face. And on election day, it was in the newspapers that this group had been illegally laundering campaign funds, and eventually it led to a million dollar fine and, and a revelation that it was uh, Koch brother operatives that were funneling all this money. Similar story on, on a global warming, um, an effort to repeal a global warming bill in California. Um, if you can inform voters on, on the true source of these corporate funds, they do become more uh, skeptical of it, especially if you're asking them to vote no. Um, it, it's much harder if you're a progressive trying to pass a consumer issue, an environmental issue, the corporate money really can come in and kill you. But if they're trying to pass something of their own, exposing that can work to defeat it. Yeah, I, I would agree. Just being able to name it for what it is and make sure that you're doing everything you can to, again, connect the dots between where the money is coming from and what the end goal is. And especially if there are other opportunities that your other um, examples that you can hold up and say, look, this is something that's happened somewhere else and this is the result of what, what, what got passed. Do we want that for our state? You know, a lot, oftentimes those examples are really powerful. Other questions? Yes. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. So this is a really good question. Um, the questioner is working for a candidate is running for state legislative race in Michigan who has, is not taking any PAC money and is only taking in-state money. But in addition to the challenge of raising money, she has a challenge that she has to work. She's a regular working person. And how do you deal with wanting to, to in, in, um, expand the inclusivity, expand the number and the range of people who are running for office when it's so expensive and, you know, you, you, you can't self-finance your own, your own existence, let alone your campaign. Mm. Thoughts? I have two thoughts. I think public financing would certainly solve some of these problems. We see it in Maine because candidates for the state legislature don't have to spend time raising money. They can work at their regular job during the campaign season. And then they go out and they knock on doors in the evenings and on the weekends. That's when they do their campaigning and they win. They're able to do both. Uh, for federal office, I had to leave my position as executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm working seven hours a day, um, <laughs> more than 12 hours, seven hours, excuse me, seven days a week, more than 12 hours a day. And um, so for me and my husband, uh, who both work in public service, it's been an enormous financial sacrifice. And, uh, and it's challenging, absolutely challenging. My staff laughs. I have one week's worth of dry cleaning that we just <laughs> clean over and over again. And those, those logistical challenges that I'm, most candidates don't have to deal with. Um, so I, I don't have an easy answer for that. At the federal level, there is a provision in the law that campaigns may pay candidates. Um, and, but until we have a different system, the system is going to be stacked against people like your candidate. And I just want to applaud her for having the courage to run and standing up and doing that work of supporting her family and taking an ethical approach to the fundraising. Because we, too, are not taking corporate PAC money. We're taking PAC money from you know, groups that, whose values we share. Um, 
And that I think is important. But I'm not taking money from groups like ExxonMobil, uh, who's wrecking our environment, or Bank of America, who brought our economy to the brink of collapse. And my opponent is. Um, there is a price you pay for public service. Anybody else have a comment on this? <laughs> well, I, I would just say both from the candidate's point of view and the voters, what we really need is much shorter campaign seasons. And, and mm -hmm. if you look at most other sane civilizations and countries around the globe right now, they have that. And it's one of those things that the current Supreme Court doctrine will not let us have. Because it, it doesn't really work for one candidate unilaterally to say, well, I'm only going to run a four-week campaign while the other person is out there raising money and campaigning full time for two years. Basically, the minute they're in office, they start running again. So um, it comes back to the court on that one. I like the idea of a time frame, but in a district like mine, I've got, you know, it's twice the size of New Hampshire. I'm challenging an incumbent, and if it's going to hinge on things like name recognition, I had to quit my job a year before the election. The only reason, I'm, I just happen to be fortunate that my husband is working seven days a week and that we bought our house young, so we own property and I don't have to pay rent. But last year, I made $14,000. It's not like I have, you know, a ton of money sitting somewhere that is funding this campaign. I just have somebody who is very supportive and I have a support network. You know, my, my parents who are watching the kids, my in-laws who are watching the dogs, everybody who's making contribution, and supporters throughout the district. We don't stay in hotels except in places like this. We stay with supporters. We eat meals with families and constituents. You know, that's how you stretch every single dollar to make sure that you're able to do this even if you couldn't afford it to start with. Rick, did you want to? Well, the only thing that hasn't been said, I, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, you could, uh, Demand once we get this amendment through, uh, because then we'll have an ability to, to whether it's public financing or demanding access to the public airways, mm -hmm. which you know isn't you know we're paying a lot of these campaigns cost millions and millions of dollars because we're all paying high price high price media consultants and in, in spending thousands and thousands of dollars on production costs and then having to buy the time. So if you could take back a little bit of that public uh, the public mm -hmm. airwaves and make it. Uh, uh, available to candidates who are running and doing things. The other thing, in which frankly I kind of go back and forth on, you know, how do you level the, the playing field when you're running against an incumbent? Maybe you term limit them. And I have, I have mixed feelings about that. But you know, that is something that was not mentioned at the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, that certainly would make things a little bit fair if you're running not against an incumbent. You're both both running for an open seat. Mm -hmm. So I think, unfortunately, we have time for one more question, and I want because I want to give the panelists a chance to just sum up. Is it, anybody have another question? Uh, yes, back there, sir. question is about whether there's a difference between the corporate money and, and union money, and can folks address that? I think there certainly is a difference from, between the corporate PAC money and the labor union PAC money. And the right wing, the Republicans, have very effectively demonized labor unions and suggested that that money comes from a small group of individuals when, in fact, um, that money comes from thousands of members and hundreds of thousands of members across the country. You know, I was on conservative talk radio in Maine and they, they chided me for accepting PAC money um, from labor unions and I received the unanimous endorsement of the AFL-CIO and they said, these union bosses that you took your picture with, Shanna, what are you doing with these union bosses? And I said, do you mean the president of the AFL-CIO who is a lifelong electrical worker from this, one of the smallest towns in Maine called Sumner, Maine? Is, is that who you're talking about? Because there are these misconceptions. And so I think labor union PACs generally represent people like my husband, who's a union member, people like my mom, who went back to school at 49 and became a nurse and joined National Nurses United. Those are the people that are funding labor unions and in turn funding labor Democrats. And I wish I could say labor Republicans, but I don't think there are any anymore. Yeah. Any, anyone else want to comment on that? Well, I, I think it's a really important question. And, and there's nothing wrong with 
ordinary people banding together around a common ideal and, and pooling their funds to advance candidates who stand for that. In fact, there's everything right about that. And, and that's true whether it's a labor union or the Sierra Club or, or the NRA or a corporate PAC. I, I wouldn't take money from a corporate PAC, but I don't have a problem with individuals who are shareholders of a corporation affirmatively deciding they're gonna band together. I have a problem when they use their corporate treasury funds to do that, because that's not why we set up a corporate right. treasury. But small donor democracy I is yeah, an absolutely right. important thing, and PACs are the, one of the, the forms that that takes place. So I, I think we have, um, in some ways, misframed the problem as being PACs and special interests, when really, to me, the, the problem is much more uh, billionaires having an unequal voice in things and, and corporate CEOs using other people's money in the corporate treasury to advance ideas that those people might not even agree with. Mm, very, yeah. Thanks. That's very helpful. So we're getting to the end. Let me just give each of the panelists a couple minutes to just for a minute and a half, maybe <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of time <laughs> to for one last statement, something that you just want to leave folks with. I would say for all of us in this room who want to see big money out of our politics, part of that is participating in electoral reform. So I would encourage you. Uh, to get involved and get engaged and stay engaged. Don't cede the ground to the Koch brothers. Don't let our despair or disappointment or discouragement lead to dropping out of the system. We need to participate. I mean, that's why you're here in this room, but we also need to tell our friends and family members we can make a difference if we join together. Thanks. We can win. We will win. Good. I would, I would uh, suggest of the nine dollars you're sending me, send four and a half. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. um, you know, I, uh, two, just two quick thoughts. Um, this number has always just really bothered me, but there's been this whole talk about, you know, the, the richest 1% and the 99%. And I always say, you know, the 99% have more votes than the 1%. I mean, come on, let's just use our votes and we can change the world. Um, We've seen a consolidation, a 300% increase in the wealth of the 1% in the last 20 years. What you don't know about is that the contributions that they've given to politicians has increased by 3,000%. There's a connection between, you hear the whole Robert Reich, uh, the movie uh, Inequality for All, there's a real connection with what's going on in this country. When I got into this race, the week I got into this race, um, Tim Cook was testifying uh, he's the guy with Apple. Uh, I like Apple products. I always say that. I've got to qualify because I've got all of them. But, you know, he's, be he's before Sander, I think it was Sander Lever Levinsky, um, talking about uh, uh, tax reform, and someone asks him, uh, does Apple pay all the taxes it owes? Or does Apple pay its taxes? And he says, well, we pay all the taxes we owe. And someone busted him on the committee. And said, well, well, what about all the money you're parking over in Ireland? I and mean, what's up with that? And he was, he was kind of shamed by it. And, you know, the same day that that was happening, uh, in the top fold of our paper, uh, the largest paper in South Dakota, we're kicking kids off a head start because of sequestration. So I say connect the dots. There is a connection between money and policy and what's going on in our capital. Get involved. This outsource, what, what we're talking about here, you can, you can change this. You, all of you here could make a difference in all of these races right up here. So you've got to get engaged because that's how we're going to win. You know, I think that Derek was right. It's, it's not enough to recognize that we have a flawed political process when we expect candidates to come to the table already having access to tremendous wealth uh, and people with it. But it, it, we've also got to present that positive alternative. We've got to make sure that we're showing not just what we're against, but what we're for. And uh, we fight disillusionment by showing people that they have a real opportunity to, to, to make real change, lasting change, that they are part of something. And so it's not just about you know, being the more persuasive uh, candidate or the biggest fundraiser. It's about inspiring people and giving them a reason to care, knowing that this is something that really does affect them. Uh, and, and I think that we have 
many of those examples where you can connect the dots for people, but we're never going to change the way that policy works in this country until we change the system in which we operate. But again, we have to do that by putting the right people at the table that will make those make those decisions to make sure that we can change the system and have a better outcome for all of us. In a place where citizen voices speak louder than campaign contributions, this is a representative democracy and it's time that we reclaim that power and make sure that our government reflects the will of the people that are being governed. I guess just in closing, I wanna push back a little bit on this point raised that candidates are still going to need the money, even if we overturn Citizens United or whatever. I, I, I think that's wrong, and I, I think it, it misses an opportunity that the net roots could really be a part of. And, and what candidates need is a way to communicate to voters. And, and one model for doing that is privately funded 30-second TV ads. And quite frankly, that is a crappy model. <laughs> now, because 30-second TV ads contain approximately zero information, really, about what the candidate stands for. It's the way we sell soap and cards and Pepsi, and it's ridiculous. <laughs> now, a, a, an improvement on that would be publicly financed 30-second TV ads, and then you still don't need to be raising the money, but I still don't think that is the best way to inform voters about what candidates are about. So now, free airtime on the federal airwaves, that's, I think, an even better opportunity, you could give it out in chunks of two or three minutes and maybe actually get a substantive message from a candidate. The earned media, the, the free press, in theory should be a primary way of informing voters about candidates. It's not serving that function very well, in part because of corporate control and consolidation, in part because people don't read them. There's a whole media reform movement that we need to prioritize to make that piece work. And there are other opportunities. You know, in, in my Secretary of State race, I was talking about a digital voter's guide that would give every candidate a series of online videos to talk to voters. So I think we need to be much more creative about how voters get their information about candidates other than privately funded 30-second TV ads, which the consultant class would have you believe is essential to run a democracy, and it, it's just not. And the, the key role for you all is as long as we can maintain some net neutrality, there is a huge opportunity with the internet and the blogosphere and the net roots for us to be our own media and for us to use the infrastructure at this conference as a way to inform voters about candidates that does not require money. And, and unless and until, and even once we pass all of these reforms, that's the type of way you make a democracy work is that type of a civic infrastructure and that type of a media where really candidates shouldn't be the only ones talking about their own qualifications. Other voices should weigh in. Bloggers should be saying, here's why I like this candidate and here's why I don't. And that's how you build a, a rich, vibrant public discussion and not privately funded TV ads. So there you go. Talking <laughs> Thank you for all that you do. Talking about a truly robust and modern town square, really. I mean, it's very exciting. So um, three things three things as we wrap up. One, um, for those of you who are interested in the, uh, the constitutional amendment work that's going on right now, um, there actually will be a vote on the Democracy for All Amendment in the Senate um, in September. Uh, we're gathering in room 357, two floors up, just to do some brainstorming about what's going on and what can be done, so you're welcome to join us if you, if you want to and bring your friends. Um, two, have to thank you so much. I mean, it's very exciting.